Are you Morning, Peter. Uh, you okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah. We look like we're sitting at the other end of a lounge, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same background, the same room on us now. That's yeah. yeah. So really, we're talking today about local commander. That's really, but really, we're really talking about local commander in terms of local authority, aren't we? Yeah, we're talking about local authority. Uh, those who are in a position to respond to an emergency and what um, is the appropriate training model for them to be delivered. To ensure yeah. that they can fulfil the role uh, as per the CCA and other requirements in terms of standards, yeah. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a set of standards out there. You've got if we're looking at strategic, you've got CCA G three there for strategic commands. Plus, you've also got the national resilience standards as well. Which uh, yeah, the skills for justice AG one, two, and three. So it's a set yeah. out for local authorities in terms of the different roles, strategic. Gold, as they call it, uh, silver and bronze. Um, it, it's in, interesting that this has sort of been picked up by the independent review, so the Civil Contingencies Act and support and arrangements. And one yeah. of the recommendations they said that is the need to be a, a fundamental reboot of the uh, training ecosystem. And they've, they've badged that under the term resilience. And I think yeah. that's about resilience of the organisation should a business continuity event occur, but also their resilience in terms of resourcing and planning and preparing for uh, a major incident and their response to that as a category of one responder. What, what, what do you think they mean by a fundamental reboot? In well, they've to, talked like, about... I think it's not, it's not, not really the, a good place now, for example. I think what they're saying is that the standards need to be uplifted. There needs to be resilience standard in place that are agreed, but also talking about in conjunction with a range of training providers like Peter Stanley and others, yeah. that um, the training options provided for local commanders are probably more flexible, uh, modular courses that are probably digitally focused yeah. now to me meaning that um, those working at the most senior level in an organisation, chief executive and directors, are not necessarily removed from their day-to-day -day work yeah. to yeah. enable the training to be focused in on their needs and an element of CPD. Um, I think the one-off training for the commanders or those who respond within local authorities uh, has been probably too little and not often enough and not backed up with CPD or exercising and training to um, enhance those skills yeah. that are necessary when you're working in a multi-agency environment. So you think it you know, the National Resilience Standards, LRS Standards have been out for three years now. Uh, and there is quite an element there for training, certainly for training. There's a, there's a, there's a whole section on what training should do. One part of it being that there should be regular training exercises to um, to judge competence of commanders locally who are attending LRS. We're not talking about blue lights here, are we? We're talking about local authority and others competence to um to attend the scg even uh, yeah i, I think that's hard down the road local authorities yeah. with that at this stage so in my experience in working in london boroughs uh, and other councils district and uh borough councils there's the turnover of staff at senior and middle management positions means that they don't have a constant that you may well have within local authority, fire services, ambulance and police. Yeah. So that, that means that there's, a, there's a, a drain in terms of resources so that by having flexible training delivered to them locally, uh, whether that be online or in other methods, modular, means that they can flex their management team to identify the right type of training for them based on their needs. So there's more turnover of staff, therefore, it has to yeah. be much more focused in terms of what those requirements yeah. are. And, yeah. and I think it also adds to the culture of the organisation. If it's seen that uh, the strategic board, the exec and number of strategic directors are getting training to enable them to set the strategic director during an emergency for local authority, I think that's well, that's well thought of within the organisation. 
as developing a culture around resilience is everybody's business. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think you touched on the key point, I think, unlike many of our other clients, the local authorities, and we found in health services as well, of course, they don't really have the time to devote to, you know, several days of training uh, on, on a venue course. Uh, it just isn't, that time isn't available. So I think very short modules would be the answer for, for, that, for, for you know, the people at strategic and tactical level particularly are really busy and, and at this stage don't really have a culture of saying, okay, well, that, that period of training is essential, so you're going to go and do it, you know, we'll, we'll stop everything else, go and do that. That culture you see in the fire service and the police and ambulance, for example, is very different, isn't it? Hmm. And and now that we're getting, you know, outcomes out of Manchester Arena and other masses, which, which is looking in and focusing on Manchester, it's quite clear as part of the, the training of local authorities needs to be around uh, the coordination part of their role within a multi-agency response. And we know where JETIF came from. It was predominantly around 999 services initially. And when it became the principal, then it moved into that arena of local authorities getting involved. But mostly that was uh, a little bit of a touch into that JETIF arena rather than the, the fundamentals of how it works yeah. and how you make decisions, for instance. And within their own organisation, how they uh, they manage the, the leadership responsibilities during an emergency or a business continuity event, because obviously there's a crossover in terms of structural command and control and coordination within a single agency, as well as being within a multi-agency response. Yeah. I mean, put your hand on your own. You've obviously worked with local authorities quite a bit, and especially at strategic level. Uh, where would you put on a scale of one to ten their understanding across their organisation of Jessup, for example? Well, on the recent training I've done, even at a, a significant uh, strategic level and a, a bronze level, so gold and bronze, I'd say they're around about two or three out of ten. Really? That low? But, yeah, and, and on top of that, um, there's always been, in, in, in my mind, the culture is that response is delivered by those who deliver emergency planning. Yeah, yeah. And we know there's been a shift, certainly within London and probably nationally, to more of a tactical yeah. advisor that's called resilience advisor, yeah. who's not taken command yeah. of an incident. And yeah. the same is happening within local authorities. So there's a shift there for responsibility. And generally, in my view, when I've looked and I've done reviews of emergency planning arrangements in local authorities, there's a willingness to get involved. There's generally a, uh, a senior level understanding at maybe chief executive who's almost directly supported by an emergency planning officer or team. What you've got in the middle of that are gold and silver who've had limited training. And in, in my ex experience, it may be as little as two hours training. Yeah. And then put on a cohort uh, in which to make decisions on behalf of that authority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore, their confidence is low. And what you get from the training provision is a way of building people's confidence around key issues about raising understanding of what situation awareness actually means, of how decisions are made in a single agency or a multi-agency environment, and how to assess those decisions in terms of using things like from Jessup, the models from Jessup, like the joint decision controls, to focus in on uh, what's necessary to uh, to make that decision and what happens after you make a decision. Yeah, I think you, if if you, if you kind of look at it now, if it's a two or three, you've got to sort of question how much of a contribution that people can make to SCG and TCG if they're not trained and don't understand it and they're at a level two. So it's easy to see why emergency services tend to drive these things. But of course, I think there's going to be a day when a uh, strategic uh, commander from a, from a local authority is going to be invited to chair or to yes. lead. And when that happens, um, that could be difficult if they haven't had the right training and accreditation. So everybody who sits around the room, certainly blue light wise, will have a strategic command qualification. Uh, a, a big part of that will have been around Jessup, around emergency preparedness and so on. So they're then 
trying to, they, they, you know, have a, a risk of a situation where a local authority chair will, or will lead with none of that um, training, none of that accreditation. Uh, so I think that's well, that is a risk. That's the first risk. Second risk, of course, is they are asked to make strategic decisions in an in an environment, uh, you know, a uh, a rapid a rapid environment without again practicing or assess uh, exercising or being assessed as being competent to do that. I think those things are a major risk to local authorities at this stage, especially after Manchester Arena. Um, the next big inquiry will inevitably concentrate on Jessup. And uh, if it's, you know, fortunately, I think for Manchester Arena, the local authority weren't central to that, um, mm. to the issues that, or some of the, or most of the big issues at Manchester Arena. But that's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. That day is going to come when the local authority is plumbing the centre of what is actually happening. And uh, for it, I think Westminster Council's response to Grenfell is an example. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that yeah. response uh, less and than... It also the, transfers, Peter, I think, into the recovery side, which is quite clear, is the leadership yeah, exactly. responsibility for that. It's recovery is the local authority. So Chief Executive expected to without any understanding of multi-agency partnership arrangements yeah. if the principles of response and recovery are the same and using the same jessed principle agendas and formats and tools to do that with the recovery plan driving the, the recovery strategy in the early stages should be down to local authority to enable them to do that um, so the principle would be the same in terms of that uh, it's it's interesting the in, independent review of the civil contingency sector that suggested that um, um, there becomes a national register of uh, recognised trainers and subject matter experts to support training. Uh, so demonstrating both that materials are up to date. So there's a consistency across the UK yeah. in terms of what's sure. being delivered. But in my experience, the consistency is often driven by the experience of the well-meaning emergency planner who's been yeah. asked to give some training to a silver yeah. or gold yeah. despite the fact that that individual yeah. may not have actually worked in that environment as yeah. a silver or gold so they're not sector competent so it's certainly recognized as subject matter expert and those with um technical specialisms and professional uh, yeah. specialisms that have got almost sector competence throughout operating that on a day-to-day -day basis and certainly the validation of those individuals who deliver in the tech training is really important as well mm. the accreditation of those people doing the training which i know yeah. these are you look all of your role players and the choosers and assessors are assessed and accredited into the appropriate standards yeah that's for sure i think i think you could see the role of the epu is a tech advisor isn't it really to a to a strategic decision maker from the local authority so you would expect that strategic decision maker to have, to have undertaken a competency assessment, undertaken the right level of training to be able to take that EPU advice and uh, translate that into a strategic decision of some sort uh, yeah. during during an SCG, for example, or a TCG. So, you know, kind of uh, devolving the uh, responsibility to the EPU is like asking a tech advisor to to run a, an SCG. Yes, yeah, so I mean, we, we know from instances such as, uh, you know, Manchester Arena in terms of the, 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 the inquiry sort of delved into the role of a tactical advisor and the yeah. National Incident yeah. Liaison Officer. Uh, and in the future, it may well be that in terms of uh, delivering training and accreditation against that, um, there'll be a need there'll be an element of maintaining competence as in the fire rescue service and police and ambulance in terms of command control and coordination yeah. uh, using that ag one two and three yeah. uh, as the way forward uh, yeah as a as a trainer uh, you, you can't really um your competence can't really be defined by time so you can't say well We've only got an hour to do this training, so I'll put a PowerPoint slide up and then we'll write off that everyone's competent. That yeah. competence is, isn't like that. Competence takes time uh, and it takes assessment against standards. It takes simulation that that is effective for people so they understand their role. You can't really do it mm -hmm. in half an hour. 
you know, or someone turning up from the EP and putting a couple of slides up and then deeming that competence. It's the start, don't get me wrong, anything's a start in terms of a, a training program, but it needs to be much more structured than that, doesn't it? Really, it needs to be, there needs to be accredited training programs against the CC, AG standards, all three of them. And, well, it's that uh, integrated emergency management process, isn't it? All the way yeah, from identifying what's the risk and the really, training, yeah. you know, developing a training strategy based on that, getting through exercise. I see we've got, a, I think we've got a, a question on the chat, uh, Peter. Uh, how will you determine competence given that courses like magic are not competence based? Uh, yes, an interesting question because our magic course is competence based. <laughs> so, of course, if you no, if you look at magic, magic is not an accreditation. It's not an accredited accreditation. The, the College of Police and all, or the, the Fire Service College, two two principal players involved in that, are not awarding bodies. Mm. So the only way you could get an accredited magic course is via an awarding body, uh, such as Schools for Justice, for example, would be one. So uh, magic, the magic course that is is delivered at the moment uh, to, to strategic commanders particularly is experiential. It's not competence based at all. The one that we deliver is, it's based against a set of written competence standards and attracts a CPD certificate following CPD approval of our course. So uh, that's one way of determining competence. I think yeah, there's nothing, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, Knocking the magic courses because they obviously got a tremendous value to people, but um, they're not competence based yeah. in terms of written competences. There are competences, and it does suggest that they they are based on CCAG standards, and there are quite a number. Uh, and it also suggests that you could use the evidence from that course for a level seven skills for justice strategic instant command course. Uh, essentially so you know it, it's not you know it is based on competence but there are no you don't come away from it with a report like we would do no, that says competent no. against each individual yeah. performance criteria you come away with some evidence that you can use to go forward for a, an award like that or towards the ccag uh, standards mm. No, but, you know, I, I took the magic course a number of years ago and I don't think it's fundamentally changed because the standard AG standard hasn't changed in terms no. of that no. and it's more of an attendance course rather than a uh, which yeah. Yeah. interestingly yeah. within the police is probably an attendance on the requirement to become a strategic yeah. commander within yeah. the fire and rescue services certainly less so very few in my experience and knowledge uh, local authority chief executives attend it even though it's highlighted as a, as a potential for to do that. Uh, and probably one of them, because of the criteria, requires that you have actually operated at a gold standard yeah. and at a gold uh, incident. Before you go there, it's as more of fulfilling and filling up your knowledge yeah, of that yeah, particular yeah. area. Yeah. Where do you get rather the Rather than doing the basis underpinning knowledge, as you would do through IPDS, for instance. I think we've got another question on here. Do we think from Paul Basson? Do you think the original well, we could have, we could have gone on for another 20 minutes with the first question, really, but let's move on. Do you think the original concepts of Jessup have been shanghaied by others and use and use of the hiding place? Um, hard to say what what Paul's what's Paul's aiming at with that question. What do they mean? What does he mean by Shanghai? Can you can you elaborate a bit, Paul? Uh, I don't think anyone... In terms of original concepts of JESIP haven't changed fundamentally. No, well... Since the game the game. Yeah. 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 Uh, so there's a consistency there. JESIP was, you know, uh, well scrutinised, I would say, uh, in the Manchester Arena inquiry. Yeah. Uh, uh, looking at the different angles and in the, in the inquiry chair's view... Um, it may well have made a recommendation to say that Jessup needed to be changed fundamentally. It didn't say that. It said it needs to be more embedded. And there was some progress program uh, progress being made in terms of uh, some changes to Jessup, and there's further reviews of that ongoing, which will probably be informed by the National Resilience Framework and other aspects 
which just talk that up with resilient framework and the government does talk about Jessup and its yeah. use there. So I think the concepts have been developed rather than Shanghai Bales. They've been de developed by time and also by learning that comes through the National Operating Learning Program, the Joint Operational Learning uh, yeah. Learning Program in terms of uh, outcomes from incidents and exercises to inform. Yeah, I think it's it's it, it's it's listed as guidance under the CCA, so no one's really Shanghai now. I don't think I don't think people hide behind it. I think people uh, people who are not trained properly and uh, and assessed properly tend to ignore it, which is a different thing. I think to answer your question, I think people do ignore it and hope it goes away. In the course at Manchester Arena, for example, it didn't go away. Um, and uh, I think that's the principle. So I think those those that work with it, it hasn't really fundamentally changed in a number of years. Recent upgrade in December, but it is, that wasn't really significant upgrade there. Yeah. So yeah. I think I think the industry, certainly the blue light industry, is comfortable with it. Um, the problem is that uh, if the if there's no no funding and no purpose from strategic managers to train and to demonstrate competence, people tend to ignore it rather than hide hide behind it, so to speak. So I don't know if that yeah, actually so it doesn't, you know, that we move from the command and control into the coordination part of it and the communication part of it, the three or the five C's, the four C's, however you want to do that. You can see where that's being transferred across into the JASA principles. But it also identifies the need for those who are working at strategic Op tactical or operational goals of a bronze yeah. must it, be used to uh, must be able to use right. those frameworks, well, which to develop the relationship and the process of decision making uh, within the multi agency environments. I totally agree. I think it's one for you, Gary. How do you address the potential cultural resistance? You've worked with local authorities. Do you think that cultural resistance is there to the word command? I think the, the the way to do it is that you do high level reviews of where the organization stands against an appropriate resilient standard. So when in London, it's quite easy to do that against the London resilient standards. Yeah, yeah. There are the national resilient standards and just to see where the organization fits across those criteria like training and exercise and uh, risk management, organizational engagement and culture, roles and responsibilities to get a good feedback into the chief executives who must be thinking if the battle review that there's something not quite right in the organization that's not working against current practices. Yeah. So you address the cultural, uh, what might be perceived as a cultural resistance by enabling them to understand how they fit against what would be a level of assurance as a previous chief fire officer and chief executive. I would always want to have that warm tummy feeling that the organization. Uh, I've got a high level of assurance. Yeah. Well, so think, by, uh, the cultural resistance is, is often moved to the side and the barriers are moved once you uh, are able to feed back what the level of uh, assurance is against uh, an appropriate standard. And the same really goes for right. commanders, local authority strategic gold, silver and bronze. Is what's the level of assurance that people can operate yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, when you step into an SCG, you are a gold commander, whatever whatever agency you come from, you're a gold commander, so to speak. Yeah. But it's just terminology. It's, the terminology isn't really that important unless people are, are not confident that they can do the role. If they can do the role, they don't really care about the terminology because they can make strategic decisions, hold up their, their organization's um, needs and responses in an SCG, can't they? So I think culturally, it's probably where we started at when you said actually it's probably people are lacking in confidence because they don't get the required training and competence assessment, to be honest. So it's yeah, not about it's the, the label. Yeah, it's, it's really a about... confidence issue that yeah, you're yeah. working in a, a, a strategic coordinating group with a lot of big beasts around the table. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who have, can see a way forward and making sure that you are comfortable and competent to work in that environment and there's an interesting study done by cardiff university which looked at 
uh, SEGs that had worked in Wales around uh, exercise and another and incidents themselves. And what, what you want to get to the situation is those who are commanding the local authority resources are able to present themselves as the independent voice representing yep. that organisation with the level of authority and knowledge in which to undertake the role. There was a study yep. done in, uh, in Norway and it looked at uh, the strategic level often being a knowledge-based level that yep. works on novel problems. And really, you get wicked problems at an SCG that need those frameworks from JESIF to develop yeah. their understanding of how to work in that environment. Uh, Paul Mastin again saying he believes gold, silver, and bronze has been changed to strategic, tactical, and operation. Not really, not at this stage. The people who operate in SCG are gold commanders. And people who operate in TCG are ta uh, uh, tactical commanders, silver commanders. But I think there's some crossover for sure. The, 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 various, the various documents don't really tie together. So essentially, you are in strategic command when you're an SCG of your own organization anyway, let's put it that way. I think there's a need for strategic commanders to be confident in local authority and other places. If you look at, for example, our, when we do simulations that require a massive evacuation, the, the local authority becomes center stage. And all of the problems that that will give a local authority need to be taken care of by the strategic commander before they give the nod in consensus that they're going to do it. Yes. they're not confident and they're not trained and they're not competent the chances are that that um decision will be um, railroaded through by the blue lights and suddenly present the local authority with an enormous problem you know yeah the, um, the local authority chief executive goes to a strategic coordinator center as a local authority gold yeah when they get there they they're managing with the other agencies, the emergency response at the strategic level. Yeah. So the two are inter interact with each other. So you wouldn't send a, a local authority silver to an SEG yeah. because they're not operating at a gold level. That's yeah. a strategic level and so they're not gold. Yeah. And, and that's that's where the uh Guild of Justice AG1 talks about responding to emergencies at the strategic level in brackets, gold. So you're a gold commander or gold officer, or fire gold, local authority gold, working with other agencies at the strategic level. So there's, a, there's an interaction uh, between between those two terminologies that Paul has raised in the question. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think the point is not to get hung up on labels. Uh, Jessup would say uh, strategic, tactical and operation as the three command levels. Uh, and other documents would say you're a gold commander when you're at SCG. It doesn't really matter. It's about how well and how 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 good you are at undertaking that role. And if you're confident, the labels don't really matter. You know, I'm at SCG. I'm a strategic commander for the local authority. I have a load of resources. I have a load of uh, organizational objectives I want to cover with my colleagues. Uh, and out of that will come a strategic plan, which local authorities could live with. Yes, and I think what the likelihood is, and what we've seen in simulation often is, the blue lights land the local authority with a strategic, um, with a, a resource a, a resource problem that they can't deal with. When you're looking at evacuating four or five square miles of a town, yeah, so I think it's really important that they are comfortable, confident with their resources, have their tech advisor there, their EPU tech advisor there and uh, are able to frame that strategic direction of the organization with the other colleagues rather than being dragged along by it in the, you know by, by it being pushed by let's say the police police uh, a principal officer for example yeah i think that's the gap for me it's about those those people from local authority coming in feeling confident having been deemed competent have been assessed they've done they've done training programs and are very confident in their ability to fulfill that role yeah, then laying on top of that, um, Peter, is the, the, the leadership element of yeah. the role. 
So the leadership of their own organization during a major emergency, whether that be in response or recovery, and the leadership role uh, as an independent voice at an SCG, yeah. where they're operating as a local authority gold within a strategic environment to talk yeah. about, you know, I'm, I'm leading on behalf of. Now, yeah. within LRFs that are mostly county-based, you generally get one chief executive who might represent the number of districts and boroughs actually at the LRF meetings. But that, the, that person may not necessarily turn off if there's a major incident declared and there's an FDG in place. It will be the chief executive from the district of borough that's affected or a suitable goal. Yeah, yeah. That. So, they, yeah, sure, yeah. so therefore, you need to ensure that the right people are going there and representing yeah. the response in that area. At the same time, the command structure that's put in place to coordinate the council's response is managed yeah. so those at silver uh, and at a bronze level are operating within that framework that's been set by the strategic coordinating group, yeah. approved and signed off by the local authority gold, and then it's operated and then put down down into the uh, into the bronze level. So it's it's managed appropriately, and the resources in terms of mutual aid can be requested. I think one of the issues that came out of uh, an incident in London, wasn't it, at Grenfell, was that the council didn't act for mutual aid quick enough uh, yeah. at the start of the incident. Well, I think... That's um, a strategic decision that uh, made. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think in terms of leadership, we could do another one of these on those, because I, I really think there is a real requirement for strategic um, local authority leaders to be leaders, because they're leading a community response. It's easy. It's a lot less complicated for a fire gold commander to lead a fire response in one organisation than to actually lead a whole community like reacting to Grenfell. And I think if you look at the at the reports from Grenfell, the local authority authority were a little bit lacking in leadership in key times for the community, and it's still going on now. You know, if that, if there'd been leadership there at that time. Uh, possibly a different type of leadership might not have had the community problems they've had since. There's another question just come in, uh, Peter, that may be appropriate for you to answer. Are your trainers from local authority leads from a, a local authority background? Of course, I can speak on the basis of from a, a local authority fire, fire service yeah. uh, and I've worked in emergency planning across London, but uh, in terms of the trainers for that, a number of our, your trainers do have that background. Uh, most of our trainers have a background in emergency service, uh, for, but most, uh, a lot of the senior trainers, as you know from your obviously uh, head of the senior group, Gary, have had a lot of experience of working in local authority in, in their role as chief officer, for example. Yeah, and they've also worked within a local resilience forum, exactly, yeah. Yeah. In which Almost local authorities and the transfer and relationships are built up in that area. So. So, for instance, myself, I've, I've you know worked through COVID in a London borough at the start, setting up their processes and procedures, and advised on other areas around local authority. So, there's a big understanding of uh, what yeah. actually how a local authority operates. Yeah. Um, and a number of people have worked in that environment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Most people, most of our trainers have worked at LRF level at some time or other. I don't think that answered the question. Probably over time now as well, I think. Just as a final thought, thinking for me is that, you know, uh, in terms of thoughts on this, that there's an identified need, civil resilience, uh, the review of the Civil Contingencies Act has, has identified that and making it more flexible and, and available and digital or online modular based uh, to increase the resilience uh, of the country, the UK. Uh, and that includes, in my view, category all the category of wrong responders, uh, yeah. included in local authorities. It's not just about 999 services. Yeah, me too. I think if you're a category one responder, you should be trained, assessed as competent and be very confident in your role. Yeah. Agreed. Whatever category yeah. one organisation you come from. Yeah. And the, and the, the basis of uh, having an organisation that's accredited and they credit that training and the competence levels, yeah. then it is, is the way way forward. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a number of standards. 
there's, there's the CCIG standards and the resilience standards. There's plenty of standards to assess competence against. Yeah. Just needs to be the will on the local authorities really to push forward, I think. I don't know if that's uh, that's the end of the... I can't see the facilitator so, uh, chat, unfortunately, sir. I think we've gone over the time. Yeah, so thank you very okay. much for who listened. I hope you enjoyed it this morning and I'll see you again. Good speaking to you, Pete, and, and hope uh, okay, the yeah. conversation has raised uh, some some thoughts in people's minds of the attendees. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, and nice to speak to you again, Gary. Bye.